My videos are not made for kids, nor have they ever been directed towards kids. If you are a kid watching this, please watch with a guardian and watch at your own discretion. The subjects covered on this channel involve nature, and nature does not care for the sensibilities of humans. Viewer discretion is advised, in general, for all of my videos. Ever since I watched Disney's Dinosaur when I was a kid, I've been obsessed with dinosaurs. Despite the awesome presence of the Tyrannosaurus in Jurassic Park, it was the gnarled hide, bone-chilling roars, and blood-colored pelt of the Carnotaurus in the underrated early 2000s Disney offering that gave me a truly ferocious predator to marvel at. Carnotaurus, though neither the size of a Tyrannosaur, nor as heavily built as the Disney version, was a creature quite unlike any other meat-eating theropod dinosaur. Ever since its astonishing discovery, it has continued to increase our knowledge about not only its family of baby-armed, cheetah-like, crocodile-armored, short-faced beasts, but also of non-avian theropod dinosaurs in general. A new development in the case of the Carnotaur may turn out to reveal something truly spectacular. Carnotaurus which means meat-eating bull, after its horned appearance, is known from a single specimen. Usually, this would not be a very good thing, since most fossils unearthed are of a very fragmentary nature. So if you only have one thing to go off of, it is of comparatively little importance. However, the one and only Carnotaurus specimen is nearly complete. Or as complete as you can get for a multi-ton theropod. The original material was unearthed as part of an expedition in South America called Jurassic and Cretaceous Terrestrial Vertebrates of South America. This expedition was prepared to increase the known fauna of the southern continent, as, prior to this, relatively little was known of the Jurassic and Cretaceous periods. The only pieces missing from the Carnotaurus skeleton were its feet and the rear two-thirds of its tail. Much of what we know of other theropod dinosaurs tends to be based off of more than one incomplete specimen. So to get a whole specimen like this, jumpstarts the discussion on this dinosaur, its relatives, and its paleo environment. Included with the bones were fossilized patches of skin. Like the fossil mummies discovered of hadrosaur dinosaurs like Edmontosaurus and Brachylophosaurus, this individual Carnotaurus must have died in such a way that sediment quickly covered the body before extensive decomposition could have occurred. The sediment then molded and hardened around the outer soft tissue of the body, which created a mold. Once the soft tissue did finally decay away, the mold became infilled with the matrix which surrounded the bones of the rest of the meat-eating bull's carcass. The final result is a skeleton with some of its outer appearance preserved as rock. This find was made in the 1980s, with its excavation in 1984. Before this time, the only pieces of fossilized skin were from the hadrosaurs, and of course, little critters from Lagerstaten deposits, like Archaeopteryx and Rampharynchus. Unfortunately, one cannot generalize the outer appearance of the rest of the ruling reptiles from a few examples of a few niche groups. The discovery of Carnotaurus brought forth an incredible example of what the skin of large non-avian theropod dinosaurs could be like. Hard, scaly, and utterly crocodilian. The lineage to which Carnotaurus belongs, in a broad sense, were rather distinct from the other carnivorous bipeds. 
During the early Jurassic Epoch, theropods were diversifying into a couple flavors, the ceratosaurs and the titanurans. Titanurae is an immense group which diversified into the megalosaurs, spinosaurs, carnosaurs, and salurosaurs, while ceratosauria diversified into fewer groups, like the ceratosaurs and abelisauroids. The ceratosaurians were characterized by a retention of usually more than three fingers, hard osteodermal scutes, ridges, and armor. Obviously, you had the crested ceratosaurids, like ceratosaurus itself, but this group also produced the abelisauroids, which took the genetic ingredients of the ceratosaurs and expanded them into new modifications. Instead of a long snout, the abelisauroids modified their skulls to produce a stronger bite with a shorter snout. They incorporated the osteoderms and scutes of their ancestors into hard, dermal armor and reduced their forearms into nearly useless nubs without functional digits. Carnotaurus, though unique in its own right, was the poster child for its taxonomic grouping since it was the second of its kind ever found. Its skin was used as the blueprint for reconstructing the skin of other related and not so related groups in the decades since its description. With more finds, it has become apparent that the abelisauroids were different in having extensive, scaly body coverings, while many other lineages of theropods went down the feathered line of evolution. Recently, a photo has been rediscovered, taken during the excavation of Carnotaurus, which stirs some new information into the pot of dinosaurian soft tissue. Fossils of the meat-eating bull were encrusted in hematite concretions. Concretions are defined as hard, compact globs of matter, which are the result of minerals precipitating around a nucleus. The nucleus can be of inorganic or organic origin, and they often appear as lumps or objects distinct from the rock layer around them. Sometimes, concretions can have fossils within them, and in the case of the Carnotaurus, its body was a nucleus which became encrusted with iron oxide. Because of the hematite concretion covering, preparing the fossils out of the rock was really, really hard. Literally. I've had some experience in fossil preparation in my university's lab. We have an air scribe and the usual dental equipment to physically remove rock around bone. The softer the rock, the easier it is to remove the fossils, and the more fun it tends to be. If you've got an ammonite and hard limestone, you gotta take out the big boy tools. I can't imagine how harder it would have been working with hematite. Here is the image which has surfaced recently. It appears to depict one of the team members and Dr. Bonaparte's field assistant and technician Orlando Gutierrez with the head of Carnotaurus. As you can see in the image, the skull bones are covered by rock. Now, there are one of two possibilities regarding what is exactly covering the skull in this image. One possibility is that it is the hematite concretion obstructing the fossils. This explanation makes the most sense. However, another explanation has been raised, based on some repeated comments about the preservation conditions of the original specimen and its condition pre, during, and post-excavation. There have been a few references to the skull of the Carnotaurus specimen, preserving some of the soft tissue of the face. These references can be found in an article written on dinosaur integument by Dr. Mark Witten. He states, the skull also bore skin impressions before they were accidentally prepared away. The lack of detail on this is because he's recounting information reported in another source. Preserved soft tissue on the head has been a rumor which has passed through paleontological circles for a while. As per the comments made by Dr. Darren Nash and Anthony Maltesi, apparently, a book by Luis Sihoyos also makes reference to this rumor. But the book apparently takes some umbrage with the preservation techniques of old guard paleontologists like Jose Bonaparte. So its bias should be taken into account. Dr. Andrea Ka had this to say. If the so-called skin was discarded in the field and thus not recognized as such by anyone, how could it then be reinterpreted as such? I mean, in absence of evidence, this seems a sort of a posteriori legend. He has a point. At this point in time, what relevance does this rediscovery have, and how much use would it be if true? The bigger question is, if this photo truly shows a skin-covered head. Dr. Jose Bonaparte 
has been given the unwarranted nickname of Bone Apart because he was more interested in the fossil material itself rather than the implications of details around them, as evidenced by an anecdote which details his technique of breaking the eggshells of fossil eggs to see if they had any embryonic skeletons within. Now, I cannot substantiate this anecdote, but Yunnan Vong chimed in with, A friend told me in Louis C. Hoyo's book, Hunting Dinosaurs, Bonaparte chiseled a lot of eggshell off the dinosaur eggs he collected. I'm starting to think he may be bad at field collecting, or too enthusiastic to expose and get things out of the field. With Dr. Nash's retort being, That's exactly what Sehoyo says in the book. He basically describes Bonaparte wrecking the eggs. It's possible that Bonaparte didn't regard them as important, given their superabundance at some sites. I don't know. Now these reports are definitely possible, but I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that Dr. Bonaparte was a bad field scientist. Since, like I said before, plenty of reviews of hunting dinosaurs suggest some of the views toward Dr. Bonaparte are unwarranted. Another thought was brought up by Jamie Heaton. I worry that because they are so irregular, barring efforts to preserve data, these are indistinguishable from concretions, which have no relation to dermal impressions. Same especially for the head. We should be careful of pariadolia, interesting if true. Not to insult the ability nor the knowledge of the Carnotaurus dig team, but crunchy, bumpy, lumpy bits of fossilized soft tissue of the extremely rugose face of Carnotaurus could easily appear as pieces of hematite matrix. Prepared off the face, along with the actual matrix, is a stronger possibility than the workers not thinking twice about discarding soft tissue material. It would also make it near impossible to go back to the same dig site and recover the pieces of hematite look-alike soft tissue. Under the premise that what we see covering the head in the photo is truly soft tissue, paleoartist Matthew Marty Neuk reconstructed the head of Carnotaurus with this new data, quite a different countenance than the upturned snout with the spiny bull-like horns we are used to. Lips now cover much of the internal anatomy of the mouth, lined with large scales to protect from abrasion and water loss. The horns are covered in extensive keratin sheaths, creating a slightly downturned pair of thickly embossed crests. All in all, this is an intriguing development in the story of this speedy sausage on legs. Unfortunately for science, and the discussion this image has riled up, it's complete hearsay. That's right, the whole scenario is so old and such a dearth of information exists about it that the whole thing is mute. We cannot now start reconstructing Carnotaurus in any way to reflect this new evidence, for it doesn't really count as verifiable evidence. This image amounts to the same scientific importance as a blurry image of a Bigfoot as it marches through the swamps of Florida. Until new fossil remains of Carnotaurus are found in the plateaus of Argentina, the original specimen is our best look at Sastre's meat-eating bull. <laughs>